Welcome to the Futures Forum Live Online, where we explore the life and times of the emerging future through the eyes of the people working to ensure the sustainable health and wealth of our shared future. Stay tuned for information, education, and inspiration. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Futures Forum Live Online. This month, October, is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and so I decided to do a very special series of conversations with a very invisible group of people who are very active behind the scenes, keeping us, our families, our homes, our communities, our governments, our businesses safe. And so on this edition, we will be talking with Danietta Fleming Maganya, who is the CEO of her own company, Covenant Security Solutions. The name Covenant should give a sense of what she does. She has a covenant as an award cybersecurity company to provide solutions that acknowledge the intersection of people, processes, and technology. Their approach is to work with their clients, which many of them are in the federal government space and other governments as well, is to support them in creating a holistic and proactive paradigm of empowerment to ensuring that we do secure the space in which we are. This company has been honored in the Inc. 5000 as one of America's fastest growing companies and has also been recognized in diversity business as one of the top 500 African-American owned businesses in the United States of America. They were also recognized very importantly in the CIO Review Magazine as one of the 20 most promising security companies in 2015. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite you to join us for the next 25 minutes or so as we hear more about cybersecurity with Danieta Fleming Magania. Welcome, Danieta. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our session. Thank you so much for taking so much time out of your schedule to meet with us. I mean, people who are in the space are busy doing balancing the you know, the needs of their clients, which are minute to minute, as well as yes. their family lives. So we're talking about the future on this show. We're talking mm -hmm. about 2030, and we're focusing on 2030 because it's a pull year for people who are focused on global challenges. And the United States Development Goals has taxed governments and communities and organizations and even the private sector to help ensure that more people do more better in terms of having access to finance, access to water, access to sanitation, access to health, access to education, access to technology. And we know why these social movements are happening, we have technology movement to either support or detract from that process. So with the growth of internet and the growth of access to the internet, because people are talking about even in remote places in Africa, putting balloons in the sky that can yeah. internet to them. We're talking about, let's call it 8 point something billion people, possibly mm -hmm. connected by 2030. As you think about this future, from your vantage point as somebody who helps governments and multinational global companies think mm -hmm. about this, what is more important to the future of the internet? Is it the state or is it the individual? Is it the private sector or is it the public sector? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, and I, ha I have a twofold. Uh, definitely when we look at 2030, I would say it's more the individual. Yeah. You know, when we're looking at how things are shaping on the internet right now, it's really about your individual experience, about you as a person, what you bring, how you interact with society, the people you choose to interact with. You can just look at something like Facebook. I mean, everyone has their own groups. They have their own ways of interacting. Um, and the idea of statehood is no longer, even, even the idea of family, when you think about it, is morphing because of the technology. Who you consider to be trusted to you, who you consider, how you... Um, align your allegiances, all of that is morphing day to day. And what, you know, we're starting to, to realize, even with governments today and private corporations today, they're starting to find that the idea of allegiance, the way that we thought about it 10 or 15 years ago, is not how allegiance works today. And it'll definitely not be how allegiance will work 30 years from now. So just take some of the concepts we're struggling with today. For example, um, one is insider threat. And many companies, many governments, I mean, we just got finished with a, a 
um, what was the young lady's name? Um, Reality winner. I only remember it because it's a unique name. <laughs> but, you know, she's gone through all the checks. Everyone thinks, okay, she should be loyal to her country. She shouldn't share this information. But it came down to a personal decision she made about, I don't like having Fox News on. I don't agree with those belief systems. Therefore, all of a sudden, the idea of my community didn't matter more than what I felt was the great important thing for me individually and what I now identify as my own individual view of what community means to me. And so... Well, mm -hmm. well is it that she didn't, has, was an individual or her sense of community is a different community from the one we thought she should be aligned to? Exactly. Exactly. And I think that it, it morphs because she could have an opinion about a different community three weeks from now. And I think that's the hard part we're having to deal with with cybersecurity because there's this idea, I hire you in my company or I hire you in my organization and therefore you should have allegiance because I'm handing you a check or we have, you know, barbecues together. And people are coming back and saying, no, my allegiance really is more to, you know, I've got to figure out how to sustain myself. So if I get access to information that's going to sustain myself and my community, then I weigh that against what's the risk of me running against what you value and hold true. So it's really kind of reshaping how we look at each other, how we look at even define community by the time we get to a 2030. So, 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 so you're talking about it in a very broad sense, because as we think mm -hmm. about that, I was trying to tease out some language and difference in language, because we think about cybersecurity probably in two ways. At the basic level, mm -hmm. is the actual architecture of the system. Yes. Um, and can the system withstand just regular operations, right? So there's that, what we say, like, so maybe that's not even cybersecurity. So let's call it cyber resilience. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. we have too many users, um, do we have enough whatever bandwidth? Do we have enough power if the power fails, if something fails, and right. so you're building your parallel system, you're building those rules. So those are things which are like, in like inherent to the fact that it's an electronic system. Yes. The, the other thing, more contentious space where most of us spare time is this idea of the threat system, which is not the things that emerge out of the process itself, is the things that emerge because somebody officially has decided to either leak company secrets mm -hmm. or to crash your system or to divert information or something that is going to be injurious to either you, your business, your country, or your community. So then, whereas more individuals will have more power, where then does the power and responsibility of national governments, as well as private firms, begin and end? I mean, how does one think through the technology itself, right? Can there be, is there uh, work being done now on the technology itself that companies and governments can have more control over internal human uh, decision making of the people who they're actually employed to them. That's the first level of security. Right. And I, I think there's two different pieces to that answer because what we're dealing with now, if I had to peel back all the technology and how we put everything together, what we're dealing with is a new paradigm about what it means to be connected, what integrity means, um, new perspectives around how do we connect to each other, how do we even build our tribes, so to speak, and what does that mean in terms of loyalty? So for organizations, without having to really, without defining that for themselves and what that's going to look like in 2030, you can't even begin to look at the technology because the technology um, you know, at least how we look at it from a, a cybersecurity perspective at Covenant is that the technology supports the people, it supports our lives. You know, our, wow. our tagline is securing your way of life. So it's not so much about me going out and saying, okay, I'm going to quantum, uh, now I've got quantum encryption. Right? Those are tools. The question becomes, how do we use those tools? You know, gotcha. I can hammer a nail with a stapler or I can use a hammer. Now, which one's more efficient? And that's the question we're starting to ask as a society when you look at things, um, just even taking some of the recent breaches like Aquifax, um, Deloitte recently had a breach. You're talking about very anthem 
some very sensitive information that's now in the public domain, so to speak. So what happens when everybody can get a hold of your social security number or your personal information? How does that define who you are? And then how does that redefine how we express and support trust relationships? And so well, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I like that you put it in the context of the trust question because when you think about it, that's where this whole idea of the clan, the family, the clan, and the tribe came from. This is how our whole legal system is built. It's a built on this paradigm that says people tend to be loyal to their families unless it's a land dispute, usually, right. <laughs> or some wealth to be divided. And then when that family broke off and got too big, they became a greater trust factor. And then you started having, you know, tribes painting their face and this marking mentor from that tribe. And so here it is, we're seeing basically that this idea of the company as a tribe and loyalty or the nation as a tribe um, has to be recalibrated, um, knowing that people have more power than they would have had in the original construct. So how do we understand how people are internalizing integrity and trust so yeah. i want to ask in a question about this idea of blockchains that has come up mm -hmm. as being a way in which to have public public trust if you will because if nobody if everybody has it but nobody has it at the same time which is what i understand of course i'm a very naive mm -hmm. and what blockchain is <laughs> then you are actually helping to build integrity. Is that, would you say blockchains uh, technology has a role to play beyond cryptocurrencies, of course, in the idea of providing smart contracts and identity management and all the kind of ways in which we look at integrity of data? Yeah, I, I definitely see blockchain and I think there's gonna be, uh, that's the direction I see a lot of organizations heading in. And I think it's going to be where we're going to go down the road, where the idea of you holding the key to your own, um, the jewels to your kingdom, to your identity, to the information you want to share, and then having a mechanism in which there isn't necessarily a government, there isn't necessarily a body that does it, but we collectively say, hey, this is how we tend to trust, and this is how we're going to manage the system collectively is really where we're headed. And I think blockchain is probably the first iteration of what we're going to see by the time we get to 2030. I so definitely you know, see that. When I hear this, and this is totally going off the wall here. Yes. <laughs> One of the things I do, I kind of go off the wall. But as I hear this, I'm hearing, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, the Bible is coming through. We are going to all be known by our numbers globally. And they're like, the 666 philosophy. But, but so I'm making light of it in some ways, but this idea then that if you're connected, if every thing that is connected, both the inanimate mm -hmm. thing, which is now smart, like my phone is smart, mm -hmm. it's a thing. So I have right now, let's say, maybe seven things in my home that are connected. Right. Um, and that I myself is the point of entry to those seven things. In mm -hmm. my case, I have myself and my husband. So that's two times seven. That's two to the power of seven or seven right. to the power of two. I don't know what it is. But there's mm -hmm. all these different interactions in which just one household interfaces with the other seven billion people in the planet. Yes. Yes. So is that what you're saying? That, that is what I'm saying. But I think that the interesting piece that's going to come in is how do you facilitate power through that? Because when you look at things like you were just talking about your phone, I mean, people have their toasters, their refrigerators, they've got uh, the um, Amazon Echo, they've got everything connected. You're fading. Um, Hello? Hopes I always like to use. In Hello? I'm Wait a minute, here. you are fading out and you kind of pause so many, so you kind of have to start. That whole question over, the whole answer over. You're like you're going in and out. Your your um your signal. Okay, am I steady now? 
You're still in now. So could you start the whole question over? Thank you. So I, I was I was agreeing with you in, in analysis of what I was saying, but I said one of the biggest issues that also has to be brokered in this is the issue around power and how power is redistributed in a system in which everyone has a piece. It's no longer this centralized view that we've had up until this point. And that's part of the issue that we're having around cybersecurity today. Because as people continue to take the information that we've utilized to maintain power structures, i.e., you know, I know that I have this health information and I broker that information between you, myself, my doctors, and, and um, those people that I've trusted to care for me. And all of a sudden it's opened up to somebody maybe halfway across the world. You know, what happens? What happens to us as a society? And so I think part of what, at least in my mind, I'm seeing as a trend for cybersecurity is this idea around what type of power structure, how do we hold power with our information? And I was going to quote one of the um, quotes I had in all my um, presentations around like cyber espionage, and it's from Tom Jesperson, and he says, information is the currency of a democracy. Yeah. So and that information is halfway across the world and you no longer have control of it because, you know, you were given the example, is it seven to the power of two or two? To, it, it actually may be, you know, two to the power of infinity because who else has access to your networks via, say, it could be Verizon or Comcast, whoever your provider is. You know, that's really the amount of people that potentially could have access to those devices. So, you know, it's really reshaping how we look at each other and I think even how we relate to each other as we go forward. And that's going to be the challenge for cybersecurity because it's a lot of different views. So are you talking about cyber, I use the word warfare guidedly, right? Right. Mm -hmm. If information is the currency of a democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And information also is the currency of non-democracies, right? This is why China, for example, doesn't want to give up its information space. This is why yeah. China has been unwilling. It has been building its own internet companies and Facebook companies and those yeah. things to control its citizens more. And mm -hmm. it has never totally relinquished access to certain points. Yes. So could then, uh, given this fact and given the fact that we live in, a, in very perilous times. Could you see then AI, AI as a policy, governments using AI as a policy um, in terms of internet governance and cybersecurity rules and privacy rules that have to now be really resunk, quote unquote. Right. In designing a system that can help to allow people some... Um, respite from their data being used in ways that they did not agree to I or to harm them so for example yeah. if mm -hmm. if we know that we say okay let's take in healthcare insurance right so let's say for right. example um your healthcare insurance is now freely available to all forget about people stealing it to get money mm -hmm. but i have a sickness i don't want my boss to know this and somebody hacks into my system mm -hmm. so the insurance company knows but my boss doesn't know right but now it's available. The right. insurance company has a breach or my boss can get around a back door to find out what everybody's health profile in right. order to decide who to promote, who mm -hmm. not to promote, or whatever. Is, is, do you right. foresee uh, a system that can, an uh, uh, artificial intelligence system or some kind of knowledge system that can have to protect against our healthcare information, for example, be used against us in ways that are injurious to us? I... I foresee the capacity to build it. Um, the issue I think we have right now is the integrity of the information that's behind it, right? Because to build it out means that you have to have a point in which you can say, I know that that's your health record and not your neighbors or not somebody else down the street or somebody else across the world. And I think that's the biggest single threat we have right now when we look about information worldwide is that every day with every breach and every time someone says, oh, I lost your social security number, there's an infinite number of possibilities of what, who could have it and what they can do with it. And, you know, that then further takes away the integrity of the system. 
So saying that we can figure out a way to come up with it, um, you know, and blockchain might be one of them along with some other schemes coming down, down the pike. We can figure out a way to protect and get integrity into it, then yes, obviously we can do um, artificial intelligence and some other technologies. But I'm also a little leery of artificial intelligence because I, I think part of the reason we're in the state we're in with cybersecurity is because we built it before we really understood it. So, you know, I remember, you know, sitting in the office as a young engineer and watching all the people sitting around the desk and they were happy because their shares were, you know, splitting and doubling. You know, they bought all these tech companies back was the late 90s, early 00 when the tech boom hit in Silicon Valley. And I remember thinking to myself, I said, but no one's talking about what I'm learning how to do. No one's talking about information security. No one's talking about cybersecurity. Yeah. And it amazed me. I mean, we went into almost the last 20 years of completely hooking everything in our lives up. And now we're saying, oh my gosh, we're drowning. We can't figure out how to, you know, save, you know, banks are getting hit. Um, governments are getting hit. Individuals are getting hit. And we're in a literal cyber war, cyber barrage. And, you know, I have the same fear when it comes to AI, you know, yes, we have it. Yes, it has so much potential, but do we as humans, as understand the potential of where it could go well enough to be able to build the safeguards in such that AI doesn't turn around and end up like a bad replay of the movie, The Matrix, you know? We kind of, you know, this is serious. That's a serious question. People talk about the matrix. It's a serious question because um, the, uh, the U.S. used to have an Office of Technology Assessment, which closed down many, many years ago. And recently, AAAS, American, uh, whatever, Association for Advancement of Science, has been trying to push for a reopening of our technology assessment function in government because we have policymakers who are making policies for technologies that they don't understand. I don't know how many people who work for Congressman A or Senator B or Governor D or City Council Member E actually understand the technology. And many times they, re they, they, they relegate their IT department simply to quote unquote managing their computers, right. not really imagining their information systems. And there's not been a, na a national conversation. And so when you think about the future, will anybody be anonymous online? That's a question I ask. Should we be able to be anonymous online? May maybe we shouldn't be anonymous online. Maybe this idea of privacy really is dead. And personally, mm -hmm. I feel like as long as my weaknesses are not used against me, I don't care who knows what I'm doing, quote unquote. Right. Clearly, I don't want people to steal my bank account and use it. But if the NSA wants to go into my bank account to see if I'm a threat, well, what do I care? Because I want to be safe. And to me, right. I'm willing to give up that individual privacy for the greater wholeness of knowing there are threats out there that need to be checked. So when you think about AI in particular, right, mm -hmm. uh, there's a group of futurists that have a group called the Lifeboat Foundation, and they look at existential threats, Right. Mm -hmm. And one could say a super intelligent AI system, right? So call it Psy, right? right. Huh? Could cause, could create an existential risk to humanity event, right? Yes. yes. These risks are real. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you as somebody who is a rising star, that has access to people of influence because you are working with government, you are working with multinational corporations, do you think that there should be some kind of a conversation, mm -hmm. um, a commission, a series of commissions from local to regional to national to global levels about how do we as a human family, a planetary civilization, treat this issue? What, what, what are your thoughts on this? I think we do need to have that conversation. My concern is do we have the right people with the right understanding of the societal impacts of an AI. And looking at just answering the question for cyber, because you had mentioned before about, you know, you have congressmen, they, they, and you're absolutely right, a lot of them don't have a grapple around what cyber means to them, what that means to the nation, what that means to um, the security of their, you know, their jurisdictions. And 
you know, when you are having a hard time just grappling with cybersecurity, which is in a lot of ways very open and shut, I wonder how we're going to be able to globally grapple with the idea that we've got technology that's learning. You know, AI is not static. It's not like you go out and you program it and you walk away and it's going to keep going. <laughs> no. You know, we've already had issues where several AI um, experiments have got, have been shut down because they thought about things in a different way. I think one of them, I, I can't remember which university it was, but it was one of the um, big universities out on the East Coast um, did an experiment where they had the AI come up with encryption. And they said, okay, make this secure so that, um, you know, this information you're sharing between point A and point B can't be um, seen. So what it did was come up with not only um, encryption, but it came up with its own language so that the humans didn't understand it because it had made a calculation that the humans were the weakest link. And therefore they ended up having to shut it down. Because, so, so that's what concerns me. I'm like, you know, if you have technology that can think, <laughs> you know, and my, you know, and this is just an aside. I mean, let's, let's be real. My husband was telling me the other day, I said, you have to send me this article because he said there was an actual um, AI robot that the first one ever to commit suicide because um, it had did something. I think it might have like accidentally ran over a child or something like that. And it knew from the programming that this was bad. And I guess it determined that because I am, doing something bad this is the way I have to respond to that so we don't know how to really even navigate ourselves let's be honest <laughs> you know what a complex question talk about a can of worms I think it's an interesting place to leave this conversation <laughs> we have opened up a can of worms but I, and what I'm happy about, quite frankly, and the reason why I'm so delighted to have um, a conversation with my sisters, um, walk, walk up black women, so to speak, yeah. um, is because we do have to begin to take a stance in shaping the future we want. Um, there's this um, very, there's lots of debate about the diversity in, in, in the whole technology community. There's a lot of conversations about diversity in in. Silicon Valley, and there's all this tough adult, you know, K through 12, etc. But right now, we have people like yourself who are actually working in this space that people don't know about and that are quite frankly can have an impact. I, I want one, one of the questions I am asking as we think about these robots, people who are programming these robots, will women uh, of a particular um, cultural and ethnic and social, social background have a difference? in the design of the systems and the choices in what gets programmed into these artificial intelligence systems. Will AI become a gendered space? Will it become also a racialized space? I don't know. These are just questions we have to ask. Right. So, as you think about all of this, would you say, I'm going to give you three words. Are you optimistic despite these challenges? <laughs> yes. Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Or are you neutralistic? This is my own word about the future of cybersecurity and our ability as humans to continue to live side by side with our own incredible genius. I am optimistic because for me, I see the societal changes that are happening alongside the technology changes. Mm -hmm. You look at the things that are coming up now around women and their power and what you know, you just look at the newspapers. I mean, we've just got finished with the Hollywood mogul who's being brought down and the voices that are coming out. Um, the whole push around diversity in um, Silicon Valley, the expansion of technology in places that probably 30 years ago, no one would have ever even thought, oh my gosh, you know, a technology innovation hub can be in Kenya now you know, or in other countries that, that brown people are. So it's, that to me is the unknown element that's exciting because I think you're going to start to get voices and perspectives around the technology that we never had before. Yeah. That up to this point, it's been, you know, very monolithic in terms of what we can do. And some question isn't just about what can we do, but how can we make an impact? And that's where I think our voice is a lot different than the voice that's been there today. So, yes, I'm optimistic. 
I'm optimistic. I'm very <laughs> glad to hear that because I'm yeah. counting on people like you to make sure <laughs> that my interests are protected. So let me finish this sentence. By 2030, the future of cybersecurity is. The future of cybersecurity is, I think it's, you know what, I want to say a non-technical answer. I think it's the people. I think it's the people. I think that's why we haven't been able to do it. We haven't sat down and reached enough people and connected to people. And I think that's coming back. I think that, I think that's the future of cybersecurity. Us, we are the future. So this, this, so I mean, the future of cybersecurity is the people. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. So yes. that's <laughs> folks. We have had this really interesting and insightful conversation with Danietta Fleming Maganya. She yes. is the CEO of Cyber, sorry, Covenant Security Solutions. It's an award-winning cyber security company that focuses on providing solutions that acknowledge the intersection as of processes, technology, and people. people. We want to thank you so much for your work. We want to encourage you to continue becoming or being the most, one of the most promising enterprise security companies from this day forward. And we hope that you can be more visibly involved in helping us sink through these larger societal systems beyond the companies and take us to the next step. So thank you so much for your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed myself. Thank you. Well, that's it, folks. You have heard from us here at the Futures Forum online. So I invite you to, you know, sit back and get ready for our next conversation. Follow us on thefuturesforum.org. And remember, the landscape of our future is embedded in the present. Safe journeys. You have been listening to the Futures Forum Live Online 2017. This podcast aims to tell and share stories about the emerging future and help us better shape the future.